Grandma died two months ago, but left me $800,000 in inheritance. I'm only a junior in college as a math major, and I don't really have any use for the money, nor do I have any debt. I'm very fortunate that my parents are paying for my education. I always heard about people losing their inheritance by spending it on garbage instead of investing. So I told my parents, I'm not gonna spend a cent of this money, I'm gonna invest all of it. I put $100,000 into a high yield savings account and bought $700,000 worth of Intel stock. This Reddit user, sad nefariousness, managed to pick the single worst stock to invest in on that day. His average price per share of Intel was $30.45 and he bought on the day that Intel would announce their quarterly earnings report after hours. After purchasing the stock, by the time he made his Reddit post, his position was down about 1%, down $8,000. When the stock market closed for the day, the price of Intel had dropped further to $29.11 as the market is expecting poor performance from Intel on their quarterly earnings report. He was now down $30,000. This was just the beginning. Intel significantly underperformed, earning only two cents per share, which was just 20% of what their expected earnings per share would be. This sent Intel's stock plummeting after hours. And by the time the stock market reopened on Friday, August 2nd, Intel was only worth $21.06. Sad Nefarious had lost $215,000 of his grandma's inheritance within 24 hours. Intel's stock dropped more than any company in the S&P 500 that day he managed to find it and his head was in the right place he didn't go out and blow his inheritance on drugs and alcohol he was thinking long term he did the right thing by wanting to invest he just didn't know how to invest a lump sum i share this story to cement in my mind and maybe in your mind what is the best way to invest a windfall of cash for investing a large sum of money there are two factors that i've got to consider what am I going to invest in and how am I going to invest it? In this context, we have a young man who's going to be invested for a very long time. He's a junior in college, so maybe he's 22, 23 years old. He's got a long time horizon. And that is very important because you do not want to invest money into the stock market that you will need to pull out in the near future. This is because the stock market can go through long periods of decline. For instance, if I'm saving for a down payment on a house, if I put that money in the stock market, it could be worth less and I may not be able to afford that down payment when the time comes, when I need it most. When I'm in the middle of making a deal on a house, I've put down a deposit, I've put down earnest money. There is thousands of dollars on the line that I could lose if I'm not able to execute the deal on the house. This shows different expected returns on average for the S&P 500 over different time periods. So this top graph, in one year, the average return for the S&P 500 is 8.6%. The maximum return that we've seen in one year is 151%. And then the minimum return is minus 58%. You could lose 58% of your investment or more. I mean, this is just historically what's happened. If you lost half of your down payment, or if you were putting money away to pay for medical bills. You can't afford to suddenly lose that money. But we can see as you invest for longer periods of time, that risk goes down and the volatility goes down. If you're invested for three years, your maximum return is now 39%, so that's a little bit less, but your minimum return is now just losing 35%. When we get to five years, your maximum return is 33% and your minimum return is 13%. So in my mind, a good rule of thumb is if I'm going to need to spend money in the next five years, then I do not wanna put it in the stock market. If I'm gonna be invested for over 10 years, then you have a very low chance of losing money over that time period. For the S&P 500, you have a 90% chance to do better than lose half a percent over 10 years. When you're talking about a life-changing amount of money, the risk is too high to invest it in a single company as opposed to a well-diversified index fund. And this is because a single company has many risks that a well-diversified index fund does not. I'm talking about idiosyncratic risks. And here is an example of four. You have business risk, risk that a company may face a competitive threat 
such as from a new product or new entrant to the industry. In Intel's case, they are getting destroyed by NVIDIA. That is one contributing factor to why their stock price is suffering compared to other companies that are into AI and manufacturing chips. Operational risk, this risk may result from a factory being temporarily shut down or a group of employees going on strike. Again, if one company is having issues, this is gonna be a drop in the bucket when you're talking about the S&P 500 or the entire US economy, for instance. Financial risk due to a company's financial structure, such as having a large amount of debt on its balance sheet. And finally, regulatory risk, risk that new regulations could impact how the company operates or its ability to earn a profit. If you'll think back to COVID, the government shut down many industries. Restaurants suffered. One that jumps out in my mind is the cruise industry. Royal Caribbean, for instance, absolutely nosedived during COVID because cruises were shut down. So during COVID, yes, the entire economy shut down, but if you look at the S&P 500, we saw a very quick V-shaped recovery. Whereas if you were invested in a company that went out of business, for instance, you would lose all of it. When you are invested in a basket of 500 companies, say with the S&P 500, for example, all of these risks go away as they are spread out over all the companies. It is entirely possible that Intel will never recover to $30 per share. In fact, companies go to zero every year. In 2023 alone, 591 companies, including Bed Bath & Beyond, filed for bankruptcy. When you're talking about a life-changing amount of money, the chance of increasing your returns a bit by investing in a single company is just not worth the downside, which is no longer having a life-changing amount of money. The second factor to consider is how do I invest? Am I investing all of this money all at once in a lump sum? If I do that, the stock market could crash the next day like we saw with Intel and I would hugely regret putting all my money in at that time. On the other hand, I could spread it out over many years and invest a little bit every day, every week, every month. However, if the stock market instantly goes on a, a rip and flies, then I would be sad that I missed out on a huge chunk of gains. No matter what choice I pick, it's possible that I will regret my decision. Now, historically speaking, a lump sum investment has mathematically worked out better. After all, the stock market is going up over time, so it makes sense that I would wanna get my money in a map ASAP. As much as possible, as soon as possible. In fact, Vanguard has already done the math. Lump sum investing will outperform dollar cost averaging 68% of the time. That's pretty good odds. However, there is a huge psychological element to consider here. It does not matter how mathematically sound your investment strategy is if you cannot stick to the plan. Many people get stressed when they see their portfolio declining and they pull their money out and they don't wanna get back in until the market feels safe again. Usually this means they are buying low when the market drops and then they're buying back in high, which is the opposite of what you wanna do. And you can see evidence of this when we compare the average investor's performance to the S&P 500. You can see the average investor has got 2.1% average annual returns, while the S&P 500 has returned 8.2% over the period of 1996 to 2015. Clearly, if the average investor just held their investments longer, then they would receive a much better return. But that's not what people do. The biggest problem is adherence. People cannot adhere to their investment plans. All of this to say that the best plan for you or I is not gonna be the best plan for everybody. The best plan is the one that I'm most confident that I can stick to. Real quick, if you're enjoying the video, please do me this one small favor and hit the like button. It makes a big difference for my channel. I would really appreciate it. And I'll continue to do my part and make better and better content. Back to the video. Okay, enough with the vague answers. It's time to get specific about the what and the how of investing a windfall of cash. And for this, I am going to turn to Ben Graham, author of The Intelligent Investor. Oops. This is the most iconic investing book of all time, and it is recommended by the greatest investors of all time, including Warren Buffett. Ben Graham recommends that you have between 25% and 75% of your portfolio invested in stocks and the remaining invested in bonds. He prefers a 50-50 split, but anything in that range is ideal. If I were to receive a windfall of cash, I would invest 75% of that money immediately into a diversified bond fund like Vanguard's BND, 
and I would put the remaining 25% in a diversified stock fund like Vanguard's VTI. These are both great funds because they both have very low expense ratios. That is the most important factor to consider when you're investing in a passive investing strategy. Every year I would sell 10 to 20% of my bond investments and dollar cost average them into stock investments. This way I don't risk my entire stock portfolio if the market crashes immediately and I still get to make a small return on my bond holdings in the meantime. Once my portfolio becomes 75% stocks and 25% bonds, I will stop the dollar cost averaging. I like this approach because I'm confident that I can stick to it and I remain in the recommended portfolio allocation boundaries. Additionally, I really like dollar cost averaging right now because stock valuations are so much higher than normal. This graph shows the Schiller PE ratio of the S&P 500 since 1880. The Schiller PE ratio takes the previous 10 years of earnings for all the S&P 500 companies and then divides that by the average share price. So as the Schiller PE ratio goes up, the chance of a crash is more and more likely. In 1930, we can see on Black Tuesday, we had a massive market sell-off. The Schiller ratio got up to 30. Well, today's ratio is 39.35. More recently, in the year 2000, we had the dot-com bubble where market valuations were out of control, getting up to nearly 45, and then we had a huge sell-off. This is not 100%, but the Schiller ratio is heavily correlated to future expected market returns. Look at this graph here, where we see on the x-axis, the Schiller PE ratio, and on the y-axis, the average annual S&P return over the next 10 years. As the red Schiller PE ratio goes up on the x-axis from 10 to 45, the expected returns in blue along the y-axis follow it pretty neatly. Normally, I do not advocate for trying to time the market, but when we're talking about a life-changing sum of money, I prefer to err on the side of caution and I would feel better dollar cost averaging. A portfolio with a large percentage in bonds will have less expected volatility and in today's market conditions, might even have superior returns. That being said, I currently do not have a life-changing amount of money so I do like to take on a little bit more risk with my investing. I keep a small portion of my portfolio reserved for investing in individual companies. And my favorite tool for analyzing companies is the discounted future cash flow model. Check out this video right here to see my tutorial and catch you on the flip side.